So um, I'm going to be talking about mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and actually a, a bit more broadly than that about the role it potentially has to play in um, addressing mental health around the world. Around the world at the moment, somewhere in the, in the range 250 to 300 million people will be diagnosable with depression. Of the current world's population, about 1 billion people will be directly affected by depression or one of the closely related mental health challenges. That if you really want to do something about heart health, you need to think about prevention. That we have got treatments for depression, we've got antidepressants, we've got a range of psychological therapies, all broadly comparably effective. Um, and we have got relapse prevention programs such as continuation antidepressants. But what we need to think about if we're serious about mental health and long-term recovery, um, particularly with depression given its relapsing course, is we need to think about prevention. And that's because the life course of depression tends to look like this modally. For the average person who suffers from recurrent depression, they'll have their first flurry of symptomatology in mid-adolescence, late adolescence, they'll have the first episode in late adolescence, early adulthood, and then they will slip into what you see here is a relapsing and recurrent course of depression. So what does prevention, secondary prevention, look like? It looks like taking folks and this part of their story where you can see they are at high risk of going into a relapsing course of depression for the rest of their life and asking how can we help folks at this stage in their course of depression to stay well for the remainder of their life. They're at very high risk of relapsing depression. So I guess in, in the heart disease metaphor, these folks have got really high blood pressure and possibly some other risk factors as well. And the rationale is if we can develop some way of intervening at this point, we can prevent um, them from becoming depressed again and enable them to live well throughout the rest of their life. One of the things we've done in Oxford around cognitive behavioral therapies for many years, including mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, is follow this sort of translational pathway. So what I'm talking about here is does this program, MBCT, work for people with recurrent depression in keeping them well in the long term? This is an IPD meta-analysis, and the answer is yes. <laughs> so um, all of the slides I'm presenting here have got DOIs, and all of the papers that certainly I publish, I ensure that they're open access so anybody can access them. Um, so if you want to go away and read these papers at your own leisure to look at the detail, I'm going to be talking at the top level, but the detail, of course, is in the paper, and they've all been peer-reviewed. So what this paper clearly demonstrates across um, um, nine randomized controlled trials, all um, using MBCT with well-trained therapists and different comparison groups, is that MBCT outperforms the other groups. It definitively shows that MBCT is an effective treatment to help people stay well in the long term. Now, one of the key next questions, sub-questions, if you like, in does it work, is the majority of people at the moment who are at risk for depressive relapse, the only thing their doctor can really say they can offer them is continuation antidepressants. And that's great because continuation antidepressants work. But they also um, only really work for as long as people take them. And they have quite a few side effects. Um, some people will report um, side effects, others won't. But for those who do and who don't want to continue taking them, it's good to think about an alternative. Some of the side effects are quite problematic. I mean, um, quite a few people with the SSRIs, for example, um, describe sexual dysfunction. And for people who are in a committed relationship and have a sexual relationship, this is something that can be very disruptive of that relationship. And so antidepressants may well keep them free from depression, which is a good thing, but it has side effects and only works for as long as they take them. So a really key next question then is, can mindfulness-based cognitive therapy teach people the skills to stay well and come off their antidepressants? And so we ran a large randomized controlled trial. This was published in The Lancet in 2016. And we were able to demonstrate this survival curve 
what you can see is this is a pretty relapsing and recurrent group. About 50% of the folks relapsed, and they relapsed in both groups. We had actually hypothesized that MBCT would outperform antidepressants. It didn't. Um, but what we then went on to do is we went on to amalgamate all the trials because to answer really complex questions well and definitively, you need lots of power. You need large sample sizes. And this is the most recent paper in JAMA Psychiatry. This is three randomized controlled trials of MBCT and one of cognitive behavioral therapy. And they're asking, can we teach people psychological skills that they can continue to use in their life that don't have side effects? Yes, they have a commitment of time because you have to do the, do the program and you have to continue practicing the skills and come off their antidepressants. And what you can see from this is they clearly can. It suggests that delivering a psychological intervention while a patient undergoes antidepressant tapering may be an alternative to long-term use of antidepressants in the treatment of recurrent depression. And I think that's great news. That offers hundreds of millions of people around the world on long-term antidepressants and their prescribing physicians an option, an alternative. Doesn't mean we should do it for everybody, but it offers them an alternative. So that's a piece of work I'm really proud of. Um, some may say, well, this is um, expensive. Well, we've done cost effectiveness analysis and it's not expensive. It's certainly not cost of, it's not less cost effective than continuation antidepressants in terms of physician visits and so on. And that I think many people have done these kind of syntheses have demonstrated. So what we have is a cost effective approach for people with recurrent depression to stay well and potentially come off their meds. One of the things that happens with new therapies is you get these sort of reactions and mindfulness and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is no different. And some years ago, there were some sort of quite dramatic headlines about mindfulness can be dangerous. It can be, can cause all sorts of up, upsetting things to happen. And actually that was quite helpful because what it forced people to do, Ruth Bayer and myself, for example, wrote this paper, which was a conceptual paper trying to say, well, what does that mean actually? What does mindfulness mean? And what does harm mean? And what does, and so we broke it all down and we did a review of the literature. And of course, mindfulness can mean, you know, just signing up for an app like um, Headspace and doing some brief practices, or it can mean going on a one week silent retreat. These are clearly very different. And somebody who is very prone to dissociative disorders um, may do absolutely fine with just headspace, but going on a one week retreat may be something that is quite triggering. So it, we, what we argued was that we need a much more sophisticated conceptual frame to even begin to ask this question. And when we provide that and do, have done the research, what we've just demonstrated is that when mindfulness based programs are taught by highly qualified people and taught um, in the way that they were intended, you do not see harms or adverse events at rates any higher than any other psychological, psychological treatment. But clearly one needs to be really thoughtful because what you're asking people to do is you're asking people to look at their minds and be present with their minds and bodies. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be finding when they look relaxation and lovely thoughts and lovely feelings and lovely body sensations. They may well come into touch with some things which are quite difficult. So we need to give them the skills and give them the safety and give them the container to be able to do that work well and do it in a staged and thoughtful way. Over 20 odd years, Mark, Zindel and John developed a therapeutic approach that is not a panacea, but offers those with a substantial history of depression, a new approach to learning skills to stay well in the long term. I think it's a really good news story. So what have we been doing since then? Well, one of the next things to ask is if you go with indicated prevention, so-called secondary prevention, is what about working a little further upstream? So we were working with adults who'd had a long history of depression, they're definitely at risk. What about with adolescents who are showing those residual symptoms of depression, low-grade depression, who are also at risk for developing depression throughout their lifetime? We've just started that work, my colleague Tamsin Ford, um, together with um, Jerry Fox. We've developed an adaptation of MBCT for depression for these young people. And alongside it, we've developed an eight week program for their parents. So the parents and the kids come along to the clinic together. And just recently, just about to come out and any day now in biological psychiatry, 
we've been able to demonstrate that um, that if we um, look neuroscientifically, scientifically, I in a brain scanner at the moment that people um, get caught in ruminative thought before and after MBCT compared to a weightless control group, you can see exactly that. You can see a proliferation of ruminative thinking in terms of self-report, but you also see it in brain changes, in particular in the salience network, the network that is involved in detecting when something is important and being able to engage or disengage. So we're being able to see that ability to see something happening and disengage in neural correlates of the psychological process of disengaging or decentering is that what we're teaching people are foundational skills for life foundational skills that are helpful to all of all of us regardless of background regardless of whatever that mental health is a fundamental human right and that if we as nations embrace mental health as a fundamental human right not only does that help us address the very real public health challenges that we have, it will actually improve the productivity, the sustainability, and the quality of life of our nations. We need to really embrace this kind of imperative. And that means an argument that we need to be thinking about mental health as a continuum, right? We're not just trying to help those kids who are struggling, we're trying to help all of our kids we're trying to help even those who are flourishing to flourish with a sense of loving learning, loving living, and not seeing it as like, oh, this means that my dad won't be disappointed in me or my teachers will be pleased with me. They're doing it out of a love of learning and a love of life. And I think that is a shift in paradigm that I think we are ready to make at this point in human history. And I think we are currently maybe going in slightly the wrong direction that we are moving to saying, okay, we have got, we've made huge progress in the last hundred years and so many indices. So now let's just push everybody really harder to become the best versions of themselves. And I think that's creating all sorts of problems. There are other ways to do this. How? Well, I think there are a couple of really low hanging fruit. <laughs> um, we have just got involved in a trial here in Oxford um, of a really simple intervention that we know is massively associated with mental health. Could it actually prevent depression? And that is sleep. Well, that's so obvious, Willem, you might think. No, it's not obvious. <laughs> because actually sleep disruption is a major problem and a major driver of mental ill health. Can we provide people with an environment and the skills to improve their sleep, encourage them to sleep well, and their mental health and their functioning in day-to-day -day life will improve. This is really low-hanging fruit. The same is true with other things like, for example, uh, diet, exercise. Can we design environments where people naturally will exercise rather than say everyone needs to go to the gym? This is low-hanging fruit. I think we need to then think about theory, programs, and accessibility.